So, Michael, thank you and welcome to the show. Pleasure. <laughs> yes, it's great to have you on. I'm really excited. Um, this is a subject I've really been trying to get into as much as possible. I discovered uh, Bhagavan a couple of months ago, actually, when I started listening to your videos and your channel. I was so excited. So I'm delighted to have you on again. Thank you. So please maybe... Before we just begin with the teachings, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, please, Michael. Um, <laughs> I, there's not really much to tell. I mean, it's um, for me, what is important is the teachings and the teachings aren't about um, Bhagavan's teachings are essentially finding out who am I, what, are, what is our real nature, what we actually are. And um, we are not the person that we seem to be. This person is just a, a fleeting appearance. It's here for a few years and then it's gone. But we are something more enduring than that. So to find out our real nature, what is the, the reality behind the appearance, that is what the teachings are all about. And I think that should be our focus rather than on any person. But if you want to know a little bit about me, I, um, when I was a teenager, I traveled to India um, in those days, it was uh, it was possible to travel overland to India. So, as 19, I travelled overland to India, and as looking for something, some meaning to my to life. Um, I've been brought up as a Roman Catholic boarding school, but I wasn't satisfied with the that type that type of religion. That sort of uh, you have to believe sort of thing. Um, I was, but uh, it's. Faith is a leap in the dark. But then I said, why to believe? How to know what to believe if it's all in the dark? So I was too much of a questioning, I had too much of a questioning mind. So when I went to India, I was hoping to find something, but I had no idea really what I was looking for. But I was looking for something that would give a meaning to my life. And after traveling for a year and a half around India, I came to Tiruvannamalai, which is the town where Bhagavan Ramana uh, lived for 54 years. And um, I had heard of him before, but I didn't know much about his teachings. Only when I went there, I read uh, an English translation of uh, Who Am I? That's a, a book that he wrote in, um, in, uh, in Tamil. It was originally Questions and Answers. He later uh, rewrote it in, that is a, a devotee called Shiv Prakashan Play had approached him when he was very young, when he was just 21 and asked him a series of questions and recorded the answers. And uh, nearly a quarter of a century later, those uh, questions and answers were published. And then Bhagavan rewrote it in a form of an essay. So when I read that, that's really the, the best introduction to his teaching. When I read that, I was immediately attractive because it immediately struck me, yes, before knowing anything else, what is most important is to know who am I? But whatever we may know about anything else, how can we be sure that it is, that it is uh, correct knowledge when we don't even know who is the knower of it? So knowing ourselves, it, it just struck me. I mean, it was immediately I, I felt this is what I've been looking for. And um, that initial attraction has just been growing and growing ever since. So really, I've, um, I've dedicated the last 40, 44 years or whatever of my life to um, to studying and trying to practice his teachings, and um, uh, they they um, for me uh, they give they give meaning to my life, and they make life so much easier because we, we all face difficulties in life. We all face challenges, and um, life is never easy for any of us, but. With he, his teachings put everything in perspective and all whatever problems we may face, they're all after all very small problems. They may appear very big problems while they're occurring. A year or two later, we've almost forgotten about them because we've got a new set of problems to worry about. So uh, his teachings help to put everything in perspective. And um, they also help to, uh, to create a certain detachment. I mean, life is never perfect. Um, Everything, whatever we, we have passes, nothing uh, 
our friends pass away, our relatives pass away, we're also going to pass away one day, everything is, is fleeting and transient. But um, understanding what is, the real, what is the reality behind all this appearance, which is what Bhagavan teaching reveals, and how to, uh, how to experience that ourself, how to experience ourself as that, um, that makes life so much easier. That is, it changes the whole attitude towards life. So life, I, I would say my life is far happier and more peaceful um, than it would have been if I hadn't, didn't have Bhagavan's teachings to support me all these years. It's interesting you mentioned experience, you wanted experience. Yeah. And with these teachings, we can actually experience this ourselves, can't we? There's yeah, no yeah. Um, such the, thing as blind faith. The, te the teachings, if we understand and accept the teachings, they do make our life a lot easier. But that it's not a final solution. We, we still have problems and problems will continue um, until we we know, until we experience we are aware of ourselves as we actually are. Now we are all, each of us is aware of ourselves as I am a person, I am Michael or I am Rab or whoever. Um, that person, that name is a name given to a body. So we, we experience ourselves as confined within the limits of this body. The body is limited in space, <laughs> or it's here, not there, and it's limited in time. It's now not a um, hundred years hence, this body will be gone a hundred years previously it wasn't here so it's all we're limited in time and space because of our identification of ourselves with the body so uh, the problems will continue so long as this uh, identification is, uh, endures and this identification doesn't even end with the death of one body because we know very well from our experience but in dream we are not aware of this body but whenever we are dreaming, we're aware of ourselves as a body and there's a corresponding world. So that body we experience in dream is just a mental projection. But how then can we be sure that this body is any different, that this body is anything but a mental projection? We, we, there's, there's nothing about our present state that can prove to us this is not a dream. Do you know, Michael, I've got to tell you, last night I was been thinking about this interview leading up to this interview with yourself. And last night I actually had a dream where I was speaking to somebody mm. and I was identifying as the I, as the person questioning this person. Yeah. And within a millisecond, I was the other person identifying with the other person. Yes, And it just shows, doesn't it, the transient nature that we can swap yeah, yeah, yeah. the basis of I onto... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any identity, because I cannot be anything other than I. But when we identify ourselves as I am this, I am this person, we are identifying with something other than ourselves. Be, because the one thing that, is all, that always endures is I am. Now in waking, we're aware of ourselves as I am. In dream, we're aware of ourselves as, as I am. In sleep, we are not aware of anything except I am. So that the one thing that endures throughout all the three states is this basic self-awareness, the awareness of our own existence, I am. So that alone is what we actually are. Everything else is, is just an appearance. We may identify ourselves now with this body, but if this body were actually what, what we actually were, we couldn't be aware of ourselves without being aware of this body. But in dream, we're clearly aware of ourselves, but we're not aware of ourselves with this body, we're aware of ourselves with some other body. And in sleep, we're aware of ourselves, but without being aware of ourselves as, as this or that, just I am. That's all that we're aware of in sleep. So what is actually, uh, the, the, that which endures through all these states, that alone is real, and that is the, the fundamental self-awareness, the awareness I am. So that alone is what is real. So is this the only constant then in this world? Yes, yes. Can you think of anything else that is, that is unchanging? Everything is changing. If, you think, if, if we think of our life, we were once a small child, now we've grown up, we are so many experiences, our memory, so many, we've accumulated so many memories, so much learning, many things that we may have 
remembered as a child, we've now forgotten. All, all things are changing. The body has changed, the, the mind has changed, the mind in the sense of our perceptions, our memories, our um, so-called knowledge about other things. All these things have changed. The one thing that has endured is this fundamental awareness, I am. And this endured throughout all the three states. I, I know you've written a book about happiness and the art of being, yeah. haven't you? And you know, like that when we attach to things that can change, then the pursuit of happiness is fleeting because yeah. the things we latch onto can change and then our happiness diminishes. So this is the only real source of happiness, actually, isn't it? Uh, Bhag Bhagavan has... Um, in a sense, the starting point of Bhagavan's teachings is happiness. The one thing that we are all seeking is happiness. We may be seeking it in different places. Some of us may be happy watching football or um, talking about politics or doing whatever work we do. Or we, we all seek happiness in different uh, places. We, we find pleasure, we derive pleasure from different experiences. Whatever we are seeking in life, uh, the, the motive behind it is our search for happiness. If we want to become very rich and accumulate a lot of money, we, why do we do so? Because we think if we have money, we'll be happy. If we want to accumulate a lot of learning, if we want to study a lot and learn a lot and be very knowledgeable, we think that having a lot of knowledge will make us happy. We, we, we are all pursuing whatever we think will make us happy. Um, but according to Bhagavan, there is no happiness in anything in this world. Happiness is our real nature. What we actually are is infinite happiness. We, but we, when we desire something, supposing I desire, um, say I desire to be rich. I think if I, have, if I have a million pounds in my bank account, that will make me happy. Because then I'm free, I can do whatever I want. I can buy myself a nice house, I can buy a car, I can go on a holiday on a yacht or fly here or there. I can do so many things if I've got that money. So we think if I have that money, that will make me happy. Supposing I then work very hard for many years and finally one day I open my bank account and I see, ah, oh, I've got a million pounds. Well, I'm happy. Ah, oh, now I'm a millionaire. Why... Is it, or is that, that one and six zeros behind it on the screen that makes us happy? That it, it's not what, we think we derive happiness from the knowledge that I have a lot of money, but it's not actually that. Because we have a desire for money, when we, when we reach a certain milestone, say a million pounds, then we are happy. But very quickly the dissatisfaction sits, uh, sinks in. Though we've got a, a million pounds, all our problems are not solved. It would be nice if we had 10 million pounds. And so then the desire starts again. How is it that we derive happiness when we know we've got a million pounds? It is because so long as we have that desire for a million pounds, that desire is agitating our mind. When we, when we get um, the million pounds that we've been seeking, that agitation is temporarily um, subdued. That is, we're satisfied. Oh, I've got a million pounds. That, that is, the, the agitation of the mind has subsided. When the agitation of the mind subsides, the happiness that is within it, the happiness that is our real nature, shines forth. But we associate that happiness, which actually comes from within, for, with the fact that I've got a million pounds. So if a million pounds makes me so happy, how much happier I'll be if I have 10 million pounds or 100 million pounds or a billion pounds? I mean, there's no end to it. But whatever we have, we will not be satisfied. Bhagavan said, there is, no, uh, there is no bottomless pit as bottomless and as impossible to fill as the pit of desire. That is, whatever desire we, we, we satisfy, another desire will come. So we, are, we can never be fully satisfied, whatever. I mean, I just use money as an example, because that's one thing most of us like to have money, because money seems to give us security and we, we, we feel a little better if we have money than, but money brings its own problems also. So if you've got money, then you've got more things to worry about. So, um, but I mean, we are all seeking happiness 
in something outside ourselves. It may be in loving relationships, it may be in family, friends, it may be in certain experiences, going on holiday or traveling or, um, or becoming very learned or getting degrees or uh, getting a promotion or getting a better car or, I mean, people seek happiness in so many different uh, sort uh, ways but whatever why we associate why we seem to derive happiness from the things we desire because when we achieve what we desire the agitation of the mind that is a desire is an agitation of the mind so that agitation so uh, now i'm feeling hungry i would like to have a um, uh, a bar of chocolate that would be very nice as soon as i as soon as that desire for chocolate arises in my mind the mind is a little bit restless. I, I, won't be, I won't be satisfied until I get that bar of chocolate. Then when I eat the chocolate, ah, I mean that, that, that restlessness is temporarily subsided. So I seem to derive pleasure from chocolate. But actually, is there any happiness in the chocolate? There's no happiness in the chocolate. The happiness is from within. Yeah. But it's, but it's not like a secret ingredient, is it, in the chocolate? No. I mean, there's no, no happiness in money. There's no happiness in um, fast cars. There's no happiness in, um, there's no happiness in anything other than in ourselves. It's, it's, the, it's the satisfaction of our desire, in other words, the, 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 uh, the, the subduing of that agitation of the mind. Uh, when the, to, to be, the, the mind is like a, the ocean. There are lots of waves on it. The desires make the waves very restless. When when the when the waves are temp when when the desire is satisfied, the waves de temporarily become calm, and then we can look inside the ocean and we see what's lying on the bottom. So long as it, the waves are agitating, we don't see what's lying at the bottom. What's lying at the bottom, deep in our heart, is happiness, because happiness is what we actually are. Infinite happiness is what we actually are. And until we experience ourselves as we actually are, we will always be dissatisfied because we cannot be satisfied with anything less than infinite happiness. And we can experience infinite happiness only when we're aware of ourselves as we actually are. So Bhagavan um, experienced this at a young age, didn't he? He discovered this yes, truth yes. at a very young age. Maybe you could tell the viewers okay. a little bit about um, Bhagavan. Bhagavan was a, a seemingly ordinary young boy. He was, uh, he was born in a small town called Tiruchuri in South India. That's not far from Madurai. His father was a, um, was a, a, a lawyer, not even a fully trained lawyer. He, was, he had some minimum qualifications in order to represent uh, people in court and things like that. So that was his father's profession. And see, he, other than that, he came from just a very ordinary family. Everything was very ordinary about him. When he was 12 years old, his father passed away. And um, when he saw his father's body uh, lying there, everyone was weeping. And he was puzzled. He said, why everyone is saying my father has gone? He's lying here. So when, when he asked one of his relatives, why does everyone say he's gone? He's lying here. And they said, no, no, this is not your father. Uh, if this was your father, wouldn't he uh, greet you and uh, talk to you with love? But see, he's just lying here, he's, he's dead. And then this was a puzzle to him. All the time till now, I was taking this body to be my father. But now everyone says, this is not my father, my father has gone. So what is the difference between this body now and how it was previously? And he thought about it, I mean, he came to the conclusion, I know the I in me, but the I in my father has left his body. So he, at that point, he understood, at least uh, uh, um, that the idea dawned on him, I and the body are two different things. So this, this obviously made a, a profound impression on him. Um, but he continued his life more or less as normal. But one day when, uh, when he was about 16 years old, he was supposed to be doing some homework for school. And suddenly he got an intense fear of death. The, the fear of death rose so intensely, he wanted to find out when this body dies, do I also die? As if with the death of this body, will I also die? So he turned his attention within, and he turned, he, he turned his attention within so keenly, but he became aware of himself as he actually is, and he then 
experience himself as the, the, the eternal and deathless uh, awareness. Um, so that he was no longer, he was no longer the person that he seemed to be previously. He was no longer identified himself as a, his name as a child was Venturaman. He was no longer aware of himself as I am Venturaman. He was aware of himself as just as I am I. I am as I am. Um, so th that completely transformed his life. Um, uh, because he, uh, it's very difficult for us to understand the state of someone because, because we identify ourselves as a person, as a body, in our view, when we talk about him, we're talking about a, a certain person, a, a body, and that body had a certain history after that. So uh, a, a couple of months later, about six weeks later, he left. Uh, his home in Madurai, and he travelled to, to the Ranamalai, where he lived for the rest of the remaining 54 years of his life. So, in our view, his life continued for 54 years after that. But in his view, uh, what happened that, that day, after that, no change occurred. He was just aware of himself with pure awareness. That is all. So, we, until we uh, experience ourselves, as he experienced himself, we cannot adequately understand his state. Um, but obviously there was, we can say, he, why his life, wh wh why that body continued to live for another 54 years, um, if we put it in um, theistic terms, we can say it was divine will, because through, through that body, these teachings were revealed. And because most of us, we are, we are always seeking happiness outside. We need someone to come and tell us, no, the happiness you're seeking is not outside. Do yourself for that happiness. Uh, experience the, hap the infinite happiness that you're always seeking. It is futile to be looking for it outside. You need to look for it within because you are that. So these, these teaching is necessary for, um, for, um, for the guru to appear externally in human form in order to tell us to turn within. But the real guru, like Bhagavan, doesn't ask us to uh, attach importance to him. He said, the real guru is within you. The real guru is what is shining in you as I. Because what, what is actually, because when, when he experienced himself as he actually was, his ego, that is his separate individuality, was thereby completely erased. So what was shining through that, uh, that person who lived for, remain, uh, for another 54 years was not a, an ego, but was the ultimate reality. So whatever he taught is our own, the ultimate reality is what we ourselves actually are. So is our own real nature appeared externally in that form to tell us to turn back within and know ourselves. Is this a state of liberation or enlightenment yes. or becoming yes. one with God? I know it's hard to put words on it, but I mean it's called by so many terms. It's called it's called liberation. It's called enlightenment. It's called salvation. It's called union with God. Um, Bhagavan generally wouldn't call it union with God because he would say, "How to unite with God when you are already that." You can unite with something different from yourself, but it is, it is our, our, our separation from God is only a seeming separation. If, if, if we accept that God is the one infinite whole, I mean, the, the trouble is people have, so, when, as soon as you mention the word God, people have so many ideas. Um, but if, if we take God simply to mean infinite whole, uh, the, the entire that which it, that which is infinite that other than which there is nothing then we cannot be other than that nothing can be other than the infinite whole because if it, if we were other than the infinite whole the infinite whole wouldn't be infinite it would thereby be limited because there's something other than it so if god is the infinite whole the one infinite reality we cannot be other than that he must be our what we actually are our real nature but so long as we limit ourselves as a person, God seems to be something other than ourselves. 
And then all the question arises, does God actually exist? And all these uh, uh, arguments between theists and atheists, all that comes into existence, only if you take God to be something other than yourself. But if you understand God is nothing but what we actually are, he's the one infinite whole, which is our real nature, then in, in other words, God is that which is shining in you as I, as I am, which is the, as Bhagavan often pointed out, that is the significance of the, of, uh, in the Bible when uh, Moses uh, saw the burning bush and God spoke to him from the burning bush. Moses asked, um, um, uh, who shall I say is, uh, has sent me? Because the burning bush told him, go and uh, release your people from Egypt and take them to... Take, take them away, yeah, whatever it is, I can't remember the exact details. But anyway, then he asked the burning bush, who should I say has sent me? He's, the burning bush replied, I am that I am. Say that, uh, uh, go to Pharaoh and say, I am has sent you. So God is there revealing his name as I am, because God is that which is shining in each one of us as I. Though it, in, in the Bible, it's... Um, Though it's revealed, it's concealed by so many other things because people are not ready to accept that um, the term I am was, is also very significant in the New Testament because Jesus often referred to himself as I am. At one point, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And one of the, re or the principal reasons why he, uh, Jews wanted to crucify Jesus, they wanted him to be put to death, was because they considered him saying I am to be blasphemy, because I am is the name of God. So they, they, he, they, they, when he said before Abraham was I am, and when they asked him are you the Messiah, and he said I am, that is taking the name of the Lord God in vain. So they thought he's claiming himself to be God. That's why they, they wanted to persecute him. So, but all that is hidden by all the so many beliefs and religion. I mean, you know, every religion uh, accumulates so many beliefs. But the essence of any religion, knowing yourself, because what is our self? Our self is what we actually are, our real nature, our real self is God, is the one infinite whole. Because it cannot be anything other than that. It, it has nothing to do with religion. It, it's just our true nature. But, uh, yeah, uh, religion can be an approach to this, but the problem is, really, the the two the two um, defining characteristics we can say of religion, any religion or, or religious sect. Firstly, there's a set of beliefs, generally beliefs that cannot be, um, that for which there's no. Um, for which there's no adequate evidence. You believe in a certain set of dogmas, doctrines or whatever. There's belief and there's identity. I, I am a Christian, I am a Muslim, I am a Hindu, I am a Buddhist. You, you, uh, when, you, when you accept a certain religion, you're accepting a certain identity. So you accept a certain set of beliefs and a certain identity. Whereas spirituality is quite the opposite of that. In spirituality, firstly, we have to question all our beliefs. But more important than questioning just our beliefs, we have to question our identity. That is the fundamental question of spirituality, which is the central question of Bhagavan's teachings is, who am I? So when we begin to question our own identity, then obviously, if, if, if I am not what I seem to be, then how can I assume that anything else is what it seems to be? So by questioning our own identity, we are questioning everything. We're questioning the very foundation of everything. We question, we're questioning the, the, the reality of the subject, the perceiver. And thereby we're questioning the reality of everything that is perceived. So the, who am I is the most fundamental metaphysical question. So when true spirituality is about investigating who am I? Whereas religion is about identifying, I am a Christian, I am a Muslim, I am a Jew, I am a Hindu, I am a Sikh, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a 
a Baha'i or I'm a whatever, so many, I mean, there's so many different religions. I'm a Protestant, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Vaishnavite, I'm a Shaivite. I mean, there are religions and then sex within religions and sex within sex within sex. It's, it's I mean, it's all this is about identification. I mean, if, if, if we are not the person that we seem to be, how can we belong to any religion? Okay, this body was born, this particular body was born in this country, so it was born in a Christian family. And it, my parents happened to be Catholic converts, so I was uh, christened as a Catholic. But uh, I am a Catholic is only as true as I am this body. But am I this body? What am I? That is what we should be investigating. So religion, it's, it's like a tool, isn't it? Because I know Jesus said, deny thyself. And, you know, I'm a Buddhist. And I know we have teachings on overcoming I, you know, yeah. discovering what the yeah. I is and then dismantling that. It's not the body. It's not the yeah. mind. It's a tool. Um, so I'm not saying religion is something to be avoided. It can be a guideline. It can point us towards it, the it, truth it, it, of yeah. it, it there can, is no ego. It can be It can be a... A pathway to spirituality but to the extent to which we are truly spiritual to that extent we are not religious and to the extent that we are very religious I and mean, very religious in the sense of a very strong identity identification with a particular um, with a particular um, set of dogmas um, to that extent we are not spiritual so uh, Many religious people are spiritual, but to the extent that they are spiritual, to that extent they are not attached to a particular identity. To the extent yeah. that they are attached to a particular identity, to that extent, that's a limitation on their spiritual uh, development. So this is where then it's an obstacle then, isn't it? The religion can become an obstacle when we identify yeah. ourselves with yeah. I am this, yeah. I am that. Yeah. Yeah. So then but we could the, even we can even make the spiritual part, I am spiritual. That it can also be an obstacle. <laughs> yeah. we, we had the, the thing is the, the the nature of the mind is always going outwards. When the mind is going outwards, we, the first thing we identify ourselves with this body. And because we identify ourselves with this body, we identify ourselves. I belong to such a country, such a religion, such a, um, such a social class or, or such a family or something. There's so many identities. Uh, uh, this body does have so many identities. It was born in a certain place to a certain family, in a certain country, in a certain cultural setting. So all these identities they are applicable to the body, but are we this? Are we this body? So we have to. Um, we religion can can be useful, but it can also become a limitation. And, and as I say, even spirituality. If we if we begin identifying ourselves as I am a spiritual person, I am following such and such a spiritual path. Again, there's a limitation. We need to, rather than letting our mind go outwards and identify with these things, we need to be turning our mind back within. Because when we turn our mind back within, to that extent, all identities drop off. Yeah, I, I love this quote you said, for as long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, this is ego. Yeah, yeah. Th that is the nature of ego. That is the, 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 the two defining qualities of ego. Firstly, as ego, we are always aware of ourselves as a body. Secondly, we are always aware of things other than ourselves. When we don't rise as ego, as in sleep, we are not aware of, any, of ourselves as a body and we're not aware of anything else. In waking and dream, we have risen as ego, and therefore we are aware of ourselves as I am this body. Not always the same body. This body is different, but whatever body we identify self in dream is different. And if this, if this life comes to an end, we'll continue dreaming other dreams. So there'll be other lives and other identities. So it's not, when it is said, I am this body, it's, it's current body. <laughs> The, the, the body in question may change, but the identification remains. That is the nature of ego. So as ego, we always identify ourselves as a body, and we always are aware of things other than ourselves. When we don't rise as ego, we are not aware of anything other than ourselves. We are aware of ourselves just as I am. So this is the actual path, isn't it? I know for some people this may be new, they may not have come across this teaching yeah. before, yeah. but this is the actual crux of the teaching, isn't it? Yeah. To isolate everything else that is not the I. Yes, yes. 
separate. Well, to, 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 yeah, to isolate ourselves from everything else. That is the, the, and how do we do that? By focusing our attention only on ourselves. If you, if, that is, attention is a very powerful tool. If we focus on something very intently, supposing you are, you're reading a very interesting book, um, and if, you're, if it's completely caught your interest, there may be noise going on all around. Nothing will disturb you because your attention is only on the book. So to the extent we focus our attention on something, we exclude other things from our awareness. In this case, so we, we're all familiar with focusing our attention on objects, books or films or our work or um, uh, ones we love. We're always focusing our attention outwards, turning the attention back within to focus on the one who is attending, on, on, the, on the, the source from which the attention comes. So it is, is self-attentiveness. It's attention turned back on itself, so to speak. So then can you, can you point to, to give us some pointers then? How would one practice then if we were trying to become aware of being aware? Is that a good way of putting it? Yeah, that, that's one way of saying it. Yes, yes. Um, that is, we are always self-aware. There is never a moment when we are not self-aware. We're always aware I am. I like that, yeah. yeah. But, but though we are always self-aware, we generally don't attach much importance to our self-awareness. Why? Because we are so much interested in knowing other things. So we allow our attention to go away from ourselves towards other things. So we are self-aware, but we are negligently self-aware. Now, after, if we, if we, um, once we come across Bhagavan's teachings, we know everything other than ourself is just a fleeting appearance. It's not real. What is real is only ourself. So if we want to know what is real, we need to know what we ourselves actually are. So we need to turn our interest away from other things back towards knowing ourselves. So how do we do that? We turn, in, instead of being negligently self-aware, we try to be attentively self-aware. And the more we focus our attention on ourselves, the less we will be, the, the more other things will recede into the background, so to speak into the background of our awareness. We'll, we, we'll be withdrawing our attention from other things, and focusing it on ourself. Our self obviously is not an object. We have a subject, not the object. So it is, it is a very much more subtle uh, form of attention. I mean, it's a very much more subtle than any, anything that we're used to attending to. But so, so it, Many people, when they first hear about this, they, they, they have difficulty understanding how to attend to myself. What, what, what is myself that I, I attend to? Um, because we are so used to attending to objects, to all objects relative to the subject, objects are gross. Because objects are all forms, phenomena. They, they, they're something that can be pointed out. But the subject has no form, no, 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 nothing that can be pointed out as this thing is the subject. It is, it's, we have to look back within and we don't find there's not a thing there. There's just the awareness. That awareness is what we actually are. So at first it may seem a little difficult to understand what, what exactly self-attentiveness means or what it means to be attentively self-aware. But the only way to find out is to try. Just like if, supposing you've never rid a, ridden a bicycle, you can ask people how to ride a bicycle and they say you have to get on it, you have to balance and everything. But however much you, you, re, you, you, you listen to what people say about riding a bicycle or read books about it or you learn even about physics, about center of gravity and uh, all, all these things, whatever amount of theory you learn, you, you still don't know how to ride a bicycle. There's only one way to learn how to ride a bicycle. You have to get on it. And when you first get on it, you're going to wobble and fall off. But if you continue trying, slowly, slowly, you get the hang of it. And you slowly, slowly find out how to balance yourself. And after some time, it's second nature to you. you, you there's nothing easier than getting on a bicycle and, and cycling. Likewise with this, it, it may seem a little um, unclear at first, but if we just try, 
follow the clues that are given in, uh, 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 Bhagavan has given us, turn our attention back towards I. Who is aware of these things? To whom do all these things appear? Um, it's, not, it's not just a matter of asking the questions. The questions are there to help us turn our attention back towards ourselves. So just try to be aware of ourselves, of, of, of ourselves, not as I am this or that, but just as I am. So it's slowly, slowly, if we, if we try, it becomes clearer and clearer what it means to be self-attentive. So anyone can, can do this. It's just a matter of practice. And but the term Bhagavan used for this practice, in Sanskrit, he used the term uh, Atma Vichara. Atma Vichara literally means self-investigation. Usually translated as self-inquiry, but it means inquiry not in the sense of asking questions, but in the sense of investigating. So, um, uh, Atma Vichara in Sanskrit, and in Tamil he used a, a word that means the same, Tannatam. That also means uh, self-investigation. So this is an investigation. When you start to investigate something, you don't know where your investigation is going to lead you. So as the investigation proceeds, the way becomes clearer. So uh, what exactly is self-attentiveness? If we knew what is self-attentiveness, if we knew what it is exactly to attend to ourselves, we would know ourselves as we actually are. We, as it were, anyone practicing this path is still learning uh, or is still refining their self-attentiveness. Uh, it is, it's like a skill that we are, we, are, we are honing that skill, refining that skill. And the more and more we practice, the more and more skillful we will become at just being aware of ourselves, being attentively aware of ourselves to the exclusion of all else. So it's only by practice that we can learn how to, to do this. I've been practicing living in the moment for the past year and I've made some progress in that. Um, but I know exactly what you mean. I mean, living in the moment, I was being aware of everything around me. So all my senses, I was using my senses, living in the moment, not being distracted by thoughts, past and future. So I was kind of getting the hang of that. But then when I came to uh, focus on myself, the person who's being aware of the surroundings, it, it is a subtle object, isn't it? It's hard to grasp hold of. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, the, the thing about living in the moment, so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, we are not in the precise present moment. Because in, in, in order to be aware of other things, our attention has to go to those other things, uh, uh, so to speak. I mean, we, we have to direct our attention outward. So we are... We, so long as we are aware of any change going on, we are not actually in the moment. We are in, we're in the flow of time. Time is, if, you, if we think about time, um, you've got the precise present moment. A moment before that is past. A moment uh, uh, in front of that is future. So where is the exact present moment? The exact present moment is actually an infinitesimally small moment. It's, it's the interface between the past and the future. The, you, one second is not the present moment, because one second, you've, you've already got some time there. So if, if you're in one second, which point in that one second are you? If you're halfway through that one second, the first half of the second is past, the second half of the second, uh, uh, second is future. So if we go down to the precise present moment, it's an infinitesimally uh, tiny moment. And in that infinitesimally tiny moment, there is no room for any change to occur. Because change occurs not in the present moment, but in the flow from past to future. So if we come to the exact present moment, it's a, it, it, we come to a standstill because nothing happens in the exact present moment because it, it's, too, it's too tiny a moment for anything to change. So, so where do we find the exact present moment? What is it, why, why do we take this time? Now, now it is um, it's 3.55 on the 10th of uh, September, 2020. Why do we take this particular time to be present? I say, now I'm here in London. 
you say you were um, in, in Swansea or somewhere, I think I saw. But anyway, what? Southport. Southport, Southport, yes, right, okay. You're in Southport. What is it that makes Southport appear here to you and makes London appear here to me? What is it that makes this present moment appear now to us? It is the presence of I. Wherever I is present, that, that moment is now and that place is here. So, but what makes the present moment present and the present place present is the presence of I. So if you want to be in the exact now, in the precise now, it had to be just as I. So we can find the exact present moment only in ourselves, not outside. So long as we're aware of things happening around us, we may think we're in the present moment. Okay, we may not be thinking of things far ahead or things far behind, but we are still within the flow of time. Whereas the present moment is, is between the flow of time, so to speak. Because the flow of time is from past to future. Or from yeah, whichever way you think of it. <laughs> it oh, no, I know what you mean. I... You know, we, we are going from past to future. So where we are, that is the present moment. So, but the present moment is so, is so infinitesimally small that if we come to the exact present moment, we come to a standstill. We are not aware of anything other than ourselves. So if we want to find the, um, there's a book, um, what's his name, Eckhart Tolle wrote a book, The Power of Now. Yes. But when people, and it, a lot of Buddhist meditation is about being in the present moment. But yeah. all these people, are, all these, generally what is understood by the now, what is happening around me now? If, if I'm eating, I eat mindfully. So, so it's all about doing. Whereas what is, in, what is actually in the precise present moment, the infinitesimally small present moment, is no doing, but only being. So no, I definitely agree, Michael. I mean, yeah. I've seen... In the present moment, we have to just be. Yeah. No, it's definitely, I've noticed, it's an advancement on the practice of living in the moment. Yes. It's going back to the source of who is experiencing yeah. yes. the external world. And as we were saying earlier, you know, um, when we're in the, in, in the ego, that's because we are looking out. So for as long as I'm focusing outwardly, using yes. that as my object of concentration, yes. I'm using the ego. Yeah, the yeah, ego yeah. is doing that. Even when we're looking inwards, we're using the ego, but the difference is we take the ego for granted so long as we're looking outwards. When we look back within, we are questioning the reality of ego. We, why are we looking at ego to find out what, who am I, what am I, so am I actually what I seem to be? So maybe just give people a rundown then. What we usually do is we usually identify the I with the body yeah. or the mind, or we yeah. say our character, our personality, our the, history. The whole, um, there's a term in, in Sanskrit that Bhagavan often used, panchakosa. Panchakosa means five sheaths. And um, there are technical Sanskrit terms for it, but basically what the five sheaths are is the physical body, the form of the body, the life, but is animating the body, the, which you call prana in Sanskrit, the mind. The mind here means the grosser functions of the mind, the thinking, the perceiving, the, uh, the remembering, the feeling, all the grosser functions of the mind. So each, each of these five sheaths, each one is subtler than the other one. The grossest is the physical body. Subtler than that is the life. Subtler than that is the mind. Subtler than the mind is the intellect. And that is the discriminating factor. The, the judging factor, the, the, that, the power of distinguishing one thing from another, that is intellect. So that's the fourth. The, the fifth one is the will, the, the, um, the, the, all, all, uh, the seeds that give rise to all our dis likes, dislikes, desires and everything. But they, the technical term in Sanskrit is vasanas. The, the vasana simply means the seed form of all our thoughts and desires and so on. So these five, uh, body, life, mind, intellect, and will, these are called the five sheaths. When we experience ourselves as a body, we are not just experiencing a, the physical form as I, 
because we never experience, we, we never, no one has ever experienced a dead body as I. So we always experience a living body as I. And nobody has ever experienced a sleeping body as I. Uh, because we, whenever we experience a body as I, we, we seem to be awake in that body. So along with the body, we always experience the life, the mind, the intellect, and the will. These all, this is one package. This package together makes up the whole person that we seem to be. But none of these five are what we actually are. Actually, Bhagavan said, all these five are insentient. That is, our body is not aware of anything. Our prana, our breathing and our heartbeat and everything, that's not aware of anything. Our mind, in this, here mind is used in a particular sense to mean, the, as I say, the grosser functions, the thinking, the perceiving, the remembering, the feeling. All these, all our thoughts, our perceptions, our memories, they're not aware of anything. We are aware of them. The intellect, the judging uh, faculty of the mind, that's also not, uh, not aware of anything. Even our will, our desires, our likes, our dislikes, they're not aware of anything. What is aware is only our self as ego. Because we identify all these things as I, this body seems to be sentient. But the body isn't actually sentient. The body is just a... A uh, lump of wood, um, well, it's not wood, but it's a, it's a lump of flesh and bones. It's, it's, got, no, it's got no inherent uh, awareness. It's because of our identification with it, but it seems to be aware. Michael, just, just intervene one, one second there. I, I think a, a mistake people can make, isn't it? You know, myself as well, you know, awareness can be um, judged as a part of the mind. An aspect yeah. of the mind. Yeah. Well, okay, yes. Um, but the trouble is, yeah, there, there are many problems there. But if, when we talk about awareness, we talk about um, awareness of things. So they, often, often we, if, if I ask you, are you aware that Moscow is the capital of Russia? You say, yes, I'm aware of that. What does that mean? That simply means that you have that knowledge. You've got a piece of information. Moscow is, and we take that to be an awareness, but when, I'm, when we're talking about awareness in this context, in the spiritual context, what we mean by awareness is that what is aware, that which is aware. We, we, unfortunately, in English, we have no, we have no exact word. We, we, we use the words awareness and consciousness, but what awareness and consciousness actually mean is the quality of being aware or the quality of being conscious. But the, just like we use the word, rea take the word reality. Reality means the quality of being real. But we also use reality to refer to that which is real. In the same sense, we're using awareness or consciousness in this context to mean that which is aware, that which is conscious. Because we identify the body, the mind as I, we take, we, we take, the, um, we take the mind to be aware. But if we analyze the mind, the mind is nothing but thoughts. Thoughts, I'm using here thoughts, not just in the sense of mental chatter, using thoughts in the sense of all types of mental phenomena, including memories, perceptions, feelings, we, we call them thoughts. None of these thoughts are aware of themselves. What is it that is aware of, it, of all these? That Bhagavan said, that is the first thought. The first thought is the thought, what he referred to as the thought called I. That is ego. It is also a thought because it, because anything other but because it's anything other than pure awareness is just a thought. It's just an appearance. But unlike all other thoughts, the thought called I is the one thought that is aware of all other thoughts. So the only thought that is that is actually aware is I. This, and then that that means ego. So ego is that which is aware of everything else. So when we identify ourselves with the mind, we seem to be, well, the mind is aware. But then what is, the, the element of the mind that is aware is ego, that is the subject. All the other elements of the mind, all other thoughts are objects known by this subject. So yeah, I mean, one, one of the, one of the in, in Sanskrit, there's a, a term, Drik Drisya Vivaka. There's actually a, a, a text which is, generally attributed to Shankara called Drik Drisya Vibhaka. What that means is the distinguishing the seer from the seen. It's literally what it means. It means distinguishing the perceiver from what is perceived. 
So ego is the perceiver. Everything else is what is perceived by it. So if, when we are investigating ourselves, we need to separate ourselves from everything that is perceived and focus our attention only on the perceiver. Yeah, just to clarify, if people, you know, we say, I feel angry, I yes. feel afraid, I am happy. Yes. There's always like, I am owning this feeling, I yes. am yes. observing yes. this feeling. But what yes. we're saying, what yes. Bhagavan is saying is, who is the I that perceives the exactly. anger, perceives exactly. the yeah. sadness? This, this is all, this is all that is... We, the ego is always identifying itself with things. So when we say, I, I feel happy or I feel miserable or I feel, um, I feel tired or I feel, um, I, whatever it is, these, we're identifying ourselves with certain, certain uh, feelings arise in our mind and we identify with that. So a feeling of happiness arises, I am happy. A feeling of misery arises, I am miserable. A feeling of tiredness, right? I'm tired. It's funny, Michael, because if we, if we have all these feelings and we identify with these feelings, yeah. then that would mean we have many eyes. <laughs> yeah, but obviously we don't. There's only one eye. So, so but, but, but what we identify with, that it, 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 there are many things that we're identifying. I mean, they're, they're all focused around this, this, this package of five sheets. All these feelings, they are... Uh, feeling for ri arising within the mind, but we are identifying them as I. But uh, if we want to know what we actually are, we need to isolate ourselves, the perceiver, from all these things that we perceive. So, what is aware is not the feeling, but the feeler. Who is the feeler? Who is it who's feeling this? Who is it who's aware of this? And it's subtle, but as you say, with practice, we can do this, can't we? You know, I heard this analogy, if a torch shines a light, it's hard to turn the light around and shine back on the light bulb. Mm. But that's, in essence, what we're trying to do, isn't it? Because uh, many analogies are used, but a lot of analogies are inappropriate. Because uh, <laughs> it's often said, you'll even hear it right in saying, but... Um, but uh, um, but the, the eye, can, just like the eye can never see itself, right? you can see its reflection in the mirror, but the eye can't actually see itself. So yeah. the, the eye meaning the physical organ eye, so uh, the, 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 the seer cannot see itself. That is wrong because as the seer, as the perceiver, we are aware not only of other things, we're aware of ourselves. The problem is because we're aware of ourselves, we are not, sorry, because we're aware of other things, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. Because what we actually are is just pure awareness. Pure awareness means awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself. So long as we rise as ego, we're aware of other things and consequently we're not aware of ourselves as we actually are. In order to be aware of ourselves as we actually are, we need to withdraw our attention from all other things including the body and mind and everything and focusing it just on ourselves, just on the perceiver. So instead of seeing, instead of perceiving what is perceived, try to perceive the perceiver. In other words, be aware only of yourself. And that is possible because the, tor the torch analogy you used, obviously you can't shine a torch on itself because a, a, tor but a torch is, is, is not an awareness. Awareness is always aware of itself. In order to be aware of anything, I need to be aware that I am aware of that. I mean, but, but the nature of awareness, we, whenever I'm aware of something, I'm aware, I am aware of that. So the awareness of I, of the, that is awareness, awareness is awareness of itself, is implicit in, uh, in awareness. So the fundamental awareness is self-awareness. We can be aware of ourselves without being aware of anything else, but we cannot be aware of anything else without being aware of ourselves. So the one fundamental awareness is self-awareness. That is pure awareness. Self-awareness doesn't mean awareness of ourselves as this person. It means awareness of ourselves just as I am. Because awareness <laughs> of ourselves as this person 
is not real self-awareness because we are aware of ourselves as something other than what we actually are. So how do you strip away all the things that we are not to arrive at the thing that we are? Um, and, and I say we, yeah, I know yeah. I, okay. I shouldn't really okay. use the word um, we. So if we try to peel away these things, our attention is on them. We don't have to peel away. We don't have to peel them away. All we have to do is to turn our attention back to ourselves. Just as if you're reading a very, or you're watching a very interesting movie, you're not aware of anything else that's going on around. You, you, may, be, you may be sitting in an awkward position and your leg may have gone numb, but you're not aware of that because you're so interested in the movie you're watching. We need to be so interested in attending only to ourselves, but we thereby withdraw our attention from everything else. To the extent that we focus our attention on ourselves, to that extent, uh, other things recede into the background in our awareness. And when we focus our attention wholly on ourselves, we thereby cease to be aware of anything else. When we cease to be aware of anything else, we are then aware of ourselves alone. That is the state of pure awareness. When we are aware of ourselves with pure awareness, that, that is the moment when ego is annihilated. Do you recommend meditation as a way of practice, or do you think daily daily life is... Um, meditation, there are different types of meditation. Basically, we can divide all meditation into two types. There's meditation on things other than ourselves, which is the majority of meditation. It's meditation on a mantra or on a form of God or on a particular, uh, on the breathing or on sensations in the body, whatever it is. It's on things, on phenomena, on things other than I. Or we can attend to, or, or we can meditate on I. Meditating on I is another name for self-investigation. Um, it is not necessary to sit with our eyes closed to, yeah. to, in order to meditate on I. Whatever we are doing, but awareness, self-awareness is always there in the background. So whatever we else we may be doing, we can at least to a certain extent direct our attention or keep our attention, hold our attention on ourselves, even in the midst of other activities. It may be difficult at first, but the more we become accustomed to being self-attentive, the more it is possible to hold on to the self-attentiveness, even in the midst of other activities. But so long as our attention, so long as we're engaged in activities that require our attention, it seems that we're only able to be partially self-attentive. So it is also useful sometimes to, um, when, we, when we don't have anything else to do, to fo try to focus our attention wholly on ourselves. So if that's what you call meditation, yes, then meditation is useful. But it's not necessary to be sitting you, you can be doing it while walking, you can be doing it while lying in your bed, you can do it in any posture, just so long as the, you're, you're not engaged in any, any activity that requires your attention. I mean, obviously, if you're driving your car, you, you may be able to be partially self-attentive. You shouldn't be so self-attentive that you thereby cease to be aware of anything. <laughs> of A certain amount of attention needs to be on. But generally, if you, I mean, I don't, I, I've got a driving license, but I haven't driven a car for 50 years, so I, or nearly 50 years, so um, I, I, I don't have experience of it. But most people who drive, they are not aware of everything they're doing. If, if for example, if you drive to work every day, you're, you're familiar with the route, you're, you're familiar with where the, the lights are, where the speed brakes are and everything, you more or less uh, drive to work with very little attention on what you're doing. Of course, there's enough attention. So if a car suddenly comes out or a school child runs across the road or something, you, you, you respond. But it's very little attention. While you're driving to work, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about problems at home or problems in the office or both. Or, or that is most of the time, our mind is on other thoughts which are not concerned with the present moment. It's not necessary for us to be thinking about the problems in the office while we're driving there. When we get to the office, then we have to think about them. Why do you think about them before we get there? But we, we all tend to uh, uh, dwell on things, on whatever is concerning our mind at that time. So w while driving your car, probably not more than 10% of your attention is on what you're doing. 
the rest of the other 90 percent is on whatever thoughts are going through your mind so when you reach work you you if you try to recall what happened on the way uh, whether the, the lights in that place were they red or did i just cross them you can't remember because you had so little attention was on that because you were thinking of other things you stopped at the red lights and you went on but you don't remember it so like that many most of the activities we do uh, in life don't require much attention we more or less do them mechanically so we a lot of uh, most of our attention throughout most of the waking state is on um, other preoccupation things that aren't immediately concerned with what we're doing at present so instead of thinking all those unnecessary thoughts we can be attending to I so even when you're driving your car to work instead of thinking other things you can be attending to I you shouldn't attend to I so keenly but you but you don't notice when the lights are red you know, but you can you can keep a lot of your attention on yourself but there are times when it may be if you're working in the office there may be a a break you, you may be just waiting for some file to download on your on your pc you've got a at least 5 10 15 seconds there you can take that time to to go deep within and then uh, because it, it's not it's not the length of time but, it, but how deeply we go within which is important yeah most, i mean it's not being discouraged is it i i've been practicing with different things and one thing i found was if i'm sitting in my recliner chair watching the pendulum of the clock I can be aware of this sensation. I can be aware of the person being aware. Mm. Relatively, you know, yeah. slowly practice and getting there. But yesterday I was speaking with someone and I found that I was I was not aware of self as I was speaking with someone. So we can practice in small steps and build up until yeah. 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 as you say, we're always aware. Yeah. 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 It's just what we're being aware of. And and another thing to um to uh, bear in mind when we start this practice, our, the outward going inclinations of our mind, what are technically called the Shayabhasanas, that means the inclination to go out towards phenomena, they are very, very strong. So for most of us, turning our mind within seems difficult. It, it's not actually difficult, but it seems difficult because we are not ready, we are not yet willing to let go of other things. So when we try to turn our attention within, we it keeps on popping out. We keep on getting distracted. We decide, okay, I'm going to attend only to myself now, but then a thought pops up and we run after that thought, so to speak. Um, so we are we are often getting distracted we shouldn't be discouraged by this because this is the nature of the mind it is not if we were if we could hold on to the, that self-awareness undistractedly that would be ideal but most of us can't do that for very long doesn't matter the thing is that we continue trying whenever our attention gets diverted and goes outward we try to bring it back within so it's a constant going out and coming back coming going out and coming back this is the nature of the practice for most of us um so um some people say oh i was meditating for 20 minutes i had no thoughts uh they do most people who say like that generally uh don't have, are not going very deep in their meditation they think simply if they can stop the mental chatter that is a state of no thoughts but they're still aware of, of sitting, for, they're still aware of the passing of the 20 minutes, they're still aware of the ticking of the clock or whatever. According to Bhagavan, anything, we are, anything other than ourselves is just a thought. So as long as we are aware, so long as we're aware of passing time, that time is a thought. So we, the, the true, to be truly uh, three of thoughts means to be aware of nothing other than I. Um, so we, we, none of us are, are able to remain in that. I mean, most of us can't even reach that point where we're aware of nothing other than I, I mean, or even come close to it. We, we try, we try, we try, but our attention keeps on popping out. What is important is that we keep on trying. Because every time we try to turn our attention back to I and try to hold on to I for as long as possible, even if it's only for two or three seconds, 
we are slowly, slowly cultivating that strength of, uh, of that ability to hold on to ourselves. So the more we practice, the more we, um, the more skill we gain in this. When Bhagavan in, in Who Am I, in the text I was talking about, the, when he, um, when he uh, was talking about how to practice, how to, whenever the, the mind gets diverted by thoughts, to turn it back to who, who is aware of these thoughts, I am, to whom do these thoughts occur, to me. So in that way, turning our attention back towards ourselves. And however many times it, thoughts arise and distract us, we, we turn back again. Um, he said, uh, by practicing, uh, when we practice and practice like this, or we practice more and more like this, the strength of the mind to remain in its source, in its, literally, he says, in its piripitam, that means in its birthplace, increases. So we, we gain the, 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 strength of, uh, the strength to hold on to that self-attentiveness by trying to be self-attentive. There's no other way. And Bowen often used to say, um, uh, nobody has succeeded in this path without persistent effort. It, it does require persistent effort because the nature of the mind is to be, of our attention is to be constantly going outwards. So we're slowly, slowly uh, trying to change its direction from going outwards to coming back within. And whenever we bring it a little back within again, it rushes out and we try again. One analogy I sometimes use, it's if we, you know, I don't know if you have them nowadays. In old days, they used to have big beach uh, balls that people play with on the beach. If you've got a big beach ball and you go out into the sea and try and push it under the sea, what will happen? If you push it down, it pops up this way. If you try to push it to stop it going that way, it pops up this way. So trying to push it deep is difficult. The more, if, if, if it's got a little leak, every time you push it, a little more air comes out. And eventually, because it's got less air in it, you're able to push it deeper and deeper. It's that, uh, the practice of self-investigation is like that. The more we, um, the more we, at first, it's just like trying to uh, push a fully inflated balloon into the, uh, under the water. It keeps on popping up. As we progress, slowly, slowly, the balloon is becoming def deflated. So we're able to push it deeper and deeper. What is the deflation means? Our, our vasanas, our inclination to go outwards is slowly getting weakened. And our love to go within is getting strengthened. So we are able to go deeper and deeper within. And we're able to remain within for a longer time. But it requires patient and persistent practice. So this pursuit of happiness, this is where real happiness lies then? Yeah, yes, this is where, this is where, as Bhagavan said, happiness is our real nature. So the more we can stay in this awareness, the happier we will become. Yes, yes, yes. Because it's the outward going activity of the mind that disturbs, happiness is our real nature. It is disturbed by the outward going activity of our mind. So the more we turn the mind within, the more peaceful, the more calm, the more contented, the more satisfied we will feel. And um, Michael, any closing thoughts before we bring the video to an end? Um, I think we, we, we've covered a lot of the basics. Um, this is, but it's, um, Bhagavan's teachings are actually very, very simple, but they're also very, very deep. So um, though uh, it, it takes, it, it's worth studying his teachings in depth and trying to put it into practice because the more we put it into practice, the clearer the, the teachings in words will become. That is, he has given, he has, uh, he, of course, he answered many questions when people asked him questions, but he also wrote various texts, very small texts, poems of 30, 40 verses. Um, but full of very, very deep meaning. Though essentially they're very simple, it can take a lifetime to, to fully imbibe what he, what he has taught us because um, the, uh, we, we come with so many preconceived ideas, so many preconceived beliefs. And as Bhagavan often used to say, this path is not a matter of learning, but of unlearning. So we have to be ready to, to, um, 
to uh, let go of all our former beliefs and completely change our outlook on life. Um, the main means of doing that is obviously by the practice. But uh, to the extent we do the practice, to that extent we will understand the teaching. So it's well worth studying Bhagavan's teachings in depth. But while studying them, we sh it's not just like studying a philosophy or something. We, we are studying them in order to put them into practice and we will understand them. To get the clarity to understand his teachings properly, it requires practice. So the more we practice, the more clarity our mind will be getting. And the more clarity we get, the more meaningful his teachings in words will become. Why is our mind being clarified by this practice? Because what is the light that illumines this entire world? What is the light that illumines our mind? The, the entire world is known by our mind. The, what is the light that illumines the mind? It is the light of awareness. When we are turning our attention back within, we are turning our attention back towards the original light, the light that illumines all light. The physical light is known by which light? By the mind light. What is it that illumines the mind light? That is the original light of self-awareness. So the more we turn our attention back towards that, so towards our self-awareness, the more we are bathing in, in clarity, so to speak. So our mind is, is clarified and purified to the extent to which we practice this. And to the extent our mind is clarified and purified, to that extent, we are thereby able to understand. We, we, we're able to understand his teachings far more deeply. When we first read them, the words are clear, uh, what the words mean. But the full import, the full implication of that, the full depth of meaning in that becomes clear only to the extent that we put it in practice. Thank you. Michael, it's been wonderful having you on today. A real pleasure. Um, you'll come on again, Michael, at some point in the future, yeah, please. Anytime. I'm always happy to talk about this subject. That would be wonderful. Uh, it's been a real delight. So where can people find you, Michael? I believe you've got a YouTube channel. And um, please tell us about your book and your website. Yeah. Well, my YouTube channel is called Sri Ramana Teachings. Um, I've got a website, Happiness of Being. And there's also a blog, happinessofbeing.blogspot.com. Um, happiness of being is all one word. Um, because Bhagavan's, why I, I called it happiness of being, because Bhagavan's teachings are all about uh, happiness, and that happiness is our being. Happiness is what we actually are. So in order to experience, we don't experience happiness by doing anything. We experience happiness by just being as we actually are. That's just being self-aware. That's our real nature. So um, I called it happiness of being. It's also an easy name to remember. Um, yes, and I, and I wrote this book, uh, Happiness and the Art of Being. But that's, that's the only book. I, um, there, there are various translations also available um, in, in book form, but most of those are available in India. Um, but they're also on my on my website and on my blog, there are also translations of his uh, original work. So, Who Am I is on my website. And from my website, there are links to um, Uludu Napadu and Upadesha India, which are two important works of his in poetry. Um, there are many other works, actually, um, because I'm always <laughs> busy. I, I'm always intending to put my finalized translations and put, make them available on my website. but. Uh, Somehow I always seem to be too busy doing other things to uh, do the, the things I would like to be doing. But anyway, um, slowly, slowly, more and more things will be available on my website. My, my blog has um, hundreds of articles and some of them go on for thousands of words. So there's no shortage of reading material on my blog. Um, but as I say, it's as far as possible, when I talk about Bhagavan teachings and I write about Bhagavan teachings, the one thing I keep on trying to emphasize is the need for practice. Because uh, by understanding Bhagavan's teachings, it does to a certain extent make our life more peaceful, more contented and everything. But we are truly benefited by his teachings only to the extent to which we put them into practice. 
And if we really want to be happy, if we really want to be peaceful, we can find that happiness and peace only within ourselves. Well, words outside are useful to the extent that they point within, but merely attending to the words instead of attending to that which, to which they are pointing, which is ourself, or um, is, we're, we're missing the point. It's, uh, the, the words are useful to encourage us and to remind us of the need to turn within, but turning within is the most important thing of all. That's a beautiful conclusion. Thank you, Michael. Oh, do you know what I meant to ask you and I forgot? The mountain behind you. Uh, that is Arunachala. That is where yeah. um, Bhagavan lived in a town called Tiruvannamalai. Uh, yeah. Anamalai is actually the name of the mountain. It's a Tamil name of the mountain. In Sanskrit, it's called Arunachala. So yeah. the, um, uh, this is the south view of the hill. So his ashram was, was on this side of the hill. Okay. Uh, but, but, yeah, eventually, I mean, the, uh, where he lived for the last 30 years or so of his life was at the foot of the hill. Earlier than that, he was li living in caves and other places on the hill. Yeah, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And this is an emanation, isn't it? Um, uh, sorry? Is it an emanation of God or...? Yeah, yes, well, yes. According to Bhagavan, that is, that is yeah. God in the form of a mountain. <laughs> yes. Which is a very... Um, um, generally, when God is given a form, God is worshipped in a in a human form, as uh, Jesus or um, or uh, Shiva or Vishnu or something. But this is uh, uh, this is uh, a very abstract form. And what the hill represents is stillness and silence, which is oh. the real nature of God. Wow! No, it's beautiful in in Buddhism. Uh... Buddha Tara, the female Buddha yes. of healing, she manifested as an island. Yes. And my teacher, Geshe Kelsang, he, he says that island still exists to this day. You know, mm. we can go and visit it and there's houses on it and yeah. people live on it. And, you know, yeah. but people find these types of things hard to comprehend how yeah. God yeah. can <laughs> manifest as, you know. <laughs> but, you know, we understand if everything is mind, then, yeah, you know, yeah, why yeah. can't mind manifest yeah, exactly, as. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Inanimate objects and yeah. so on and so the, on. The thing is, uh, Bhagavan explained it very nicely. He said, if, if, if oneself is a form, the world and God will be likewise. That is, so long as we mistake ourselves to be a form, we, we cannot conceive of a formless God. In Islam, for example, they say God is formless. Yeah. But even the idea God is formless, that idea is a form. So yeah. we, we, in order to know God as formless, we need to know ourselves as formless. When we know yeah. ourselves as formless, then we will know there's no distinction. Because all distinctions, uh, forms create distinctions. If there's no form, there are no distinctions. Yeah. So yeah. the state in which we lose ourselves in God and God alone remains, that is the state of formlessness. But until then, it's appropriate to worship God in form. But once, um, 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 once some, um, uh, all sorts of people came to Bhagavan, and among Bhagavan's devotees, there were followers of all people from all religious backgrounds. So Bhagavan had Muslim devotees also. Once a, a Muslim came to Bhagavan and was saying to Bhagavan, isn't it wrong to worship God in form? And Bhagavan said, yes, definitely it's wrong to worship God in form, but isn't it wrong to worship, but what else, you, he, he, oh no, no, that, he didn't, Bhagavan didn't quite say like that. He said, yes, if you, it, it, it is better to worship God as formless, but when you are worshipping yourself as a form, how can you worship uh, God as formless? No, I'm not worshipping myself. He said, yes, you are every day. What are you doing? You're, you're having bath, you're, you're feeding this body, you're, you're treating it with so much uh, um, regard and affection. What are people in the temples doing? They, they are bathing the, the idol, they are clothing it, they are offering food to it. It's just what you are doing to the body. So when, when we treat this body with so much uh, love and, uh, and respect, 
why don't we treat so what, what's wrong with treating some name of of course that that idol just like this body is not i that idol is not god but so long as you take this body to be i there's no wrong in taking that idol to be god yeah of course no one who worships an idol thinks god is only confined within that idol it's yeah. the idol is there to focus the attention yeah yeah no very good you know i i had um someone come into my house the week and i've got a, a shrine in the living room you know yeah. i don't do television i've got a shrine in the living room and i could see him looking at it you know like it, it was like he, he felt uncomfortable because it's yeah. not the kind of thing you see in <laughs> someone's house <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? But yeah, we're the same, you know, wherever we see a Buddha statue, we, we, we regard it as an essence yeah, of yeah. our potential, our potential, yeah. um, you know, exactly. an emanation of Buddha, maybe. Yeah. You know, I don't know where these are uh, crafted. Who knows, yeah. you know, yeah. is there? Yeah. Bhag Bhagavan has sung five hymns in Tamil on Aranachala. Yeah. And if you read those five hymns, it is he's very clearly referring to the hill he's often talking about in the form of the hill but he's also refers to it as um ocean of compassion in the form of a hill wow so and, and he also many places he explicitly says aaron actually is is what is, sh is shining within you as i so um it's is he worshiping a, an external form or is he worshiping what is in as i it's it's so yeah, it's so skillfully worded, you can take it either as referring to the form of the hill or referring to I. Wow. And in the very first verse of the main hymn, Arunachakshiramai, he says, Arunachal, you root out the egos of those who consider Arunachal to be only I. <laughs> I know these yeah. teachings are really deep. But though they're deep, they're actually very simple. Yeah, yeah. As you say, it, yeah, it is very simple. Just becoming aware of being aware. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Simplicity lies in oneness. Yeah. In the state of that's why right, Advaita means non-duality, no, no two-ness. So in yeah. the state of perfect oneness, that is the state of perfect simplicity. And what is the state of of non-duality? The state of self-attentiveness, so long as we're attending to anything other than ourself, there's duality, there's the subject and the object. But when we're attending only to ourself, that is the state of oneness. And that is the state of perfect simplicity.